So thank you, Liz. I'm Carol Treadwell, and I work for the Bob Marshall Willingness Foundation as the executive director. My degrees are in geology and geomorphology, so I'm going to hazard to guess that just about everybody in this room knows more about white bark pine than I do. And, but my, the strength that I brought to this project is that I have experience leading successful citizen science projects. So I'm going to talk about the citizen science data collection that the foundation did with volunteers in the Bob. Um, this is going to be science light, as one of our previous speakers said. If you want to know the detailed science behind this, um, and the results, Molly Ratzlaff, who's the author of this paper, um, has a poster session on this in the hall, so um, she can talk more on the scientific findings of this. I will talk a little bit about the Bob Marshall Willingness Foundation, who we are, what we do, and how we got involved with the citizen science on this project. Um, and how to run an effective citizen science program. I'll talk about, this is a comparative study, 20 years of um, data, and so, some of the results, and then the implications of using volunteers to do citizen science. So a little bit about the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. We engage volunteers in meaningful projects that give back to wilderness by providing stewardship through opening trails, removing noxious weeds, and other conservation projects, um, including this citizen science project. And every year, we coordinate about 40 volunteer projects that utilize volunteers, about 300 to 400 volunteers. And those volunteers, lay down a lot of miles, cut a lot of trees, remove a lot of weeds, do a lot of really good work for wilderness uh, conservation. And in return, we feed them really well to fuel them on their long hikes in the wilderness. Trips last anywhere from three days to nine days, depending upon how deep into the wilderness they get. The value of that labor that they donate to public lands is somewhere around $400,000 every year. So the bottom line on this is that the, um, we are very effective at getting volunteer boots on the ground. We lead them, feed them, keep them safe, and give them direction on how to do good work. So the local White Bark Pine group, um, working group here, thought that we would be a cost-effective way to get some data um, to revisit White Bark Pine plots that had originally been studied back in the 90s, there was no Forest Service funding to go into wilderness at the time from any of the departments that was interested in um, this study. So we took it up and put the boots on the ground and found some funding for it. For those of you who are not familiar with this part of Montana, the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex is actually composed of three different wilderness areas, the Great Bear, Bob Marshall and Scapegoat Wilderness. It's a million and a half acre area and 44% of it has the potential to support white bark pine. So a little background. Um, the original study on assessing the health and status of white bark pine in the Bob was conducted in the early 90s. Bob Keen et al, I think it was his dissertation research examined 116 plots in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex using standard forestry methods. In 2014 and 2000, or 2013 and 14, we employed uh, volunteer groups to go out and uh, revisit 20% of those plots, or 25 plots. Um, and this, on the right, is a picture of one of our volunteer groups, our crew leader, Jimmy Durda, who is here today. Um, and we also were accompanied uh, on some of our trips with some Forest Service helpers. This is Eric? Elliot. Elliot. Well, I got the first letter right. Um, 
and our volunteer group. Uh, one thing about the composition of our volunteers is it's people who have time to don't or can donate their time. So many of those folks are re of retirement age. Um, and I think when Bob and his colleagues went out and visited, they were young, strapping lads and lasses of the ages in the early 20s. So some of the peaks and ridges that they visited were quite gnarly climbs, and we tried to accomplish this with a different age group. So um, one of the things that volunteers look for when they sign up, is this going to fit with what I can do? So maybe they didn't want to swing a Pulaski or be on one end of a misery whip, so it, Instead, they decided they would hike to the highest peaks in the bottom. So this is a map of all the plots that we revisited. And um, you can see we tried to cover the landscape from north to south and east to west. So our method was to recruit hardy volunteers that wanted to climb to the top of steep peaks and ridges, and relocate the plots from the 1990 study, and then um, remeasure the 10th acre plots using the, state, uh, the same standard forestry methods that had been used in the 90s. The first step in this is to train the volunteers, because your data is only as good as the training you give your volunteers. So um, first we train the crew leader, and then the crew leader would take the volunteers out and train them. So training, training, training. And here's Bob sitting on the top of a desert mountain um, talking about some important thing about white bark pine, and then demonstrating the difference on identifying white bark pine versus western white pine. Um, when the volunteer groups reached camp, they would also receive some training and background. Why are we doing this, this is how you measure DBH, all that kind of stuff before they actually hiked to the top of the mountain and had to do that. So training, 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 and practice, practice, practice. The first step um, was to reloc the, relocate the plots, and these plots are in wilderness, so they were not monumented because uh, leave nothing behind and leave no trace. So um, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, the plots had been marked by GPS and photographs were taken from Plot Center. But the first challenge, of course, was that in the 90s, GPSs were big boxes on the top of long sticks and the military scrambled the signal, as you know. So, and they also took data in a different coordinate system. So we had to convert NAT 27 to WGS 84 and then we would use the GPS to navigate to plot center, take the photographs out, and then try to refine our location. Surprisingly, this worked well in many locations. In some locations, we ended up on the wrong side of the mountain. And in one incident, we climbed to the top of a ridge to find that this beautiful thousand-year-old white bark pine had been burnt down by a fire in the 80s. Um, but we looked closely at the photograph and saw this 90s dude wearing tight, tight red shorts um, standing on this very unique looking rock. And so we ran around the mountainside and we found that rock. And here's our volunteer, Melissa, and she's standing on that rock and leaning on this tree that's no longer there. Uh, and then we measured, uh, took, measured out the 10th acre plots, and we measured trees and snags and counted saplings and seedlings. For trees, we measured um, height, crown base height, DBH, canopy position, and health. And if it were it was a white bark pine, we would um, assess the percent of crown kill if it was affected by rust. For snags, we measured the same information plus decay class and recorded the cause of death. Um, I would say this is probably the most difficult piece of information to collect. It's very hard to train volunteers to identify a cause of death in a snag that's been laying on the ground for 20 years. Um, this protocol is you know, it's very, you guys are foresters, you're like, well, I can do this in my sleep, but many volunteers are um, not foresters and maybe not 
scientists. And so, um, you know, some citizen sciences count the number of loons or identify boy goats versus girl goats. This was very um, um, detailed for citizen science. And so, um, I think as we'll, I'll demonstrate later in the results section, um, this um, was the hardest thing for us to do. Once we were at the site and measuring this, um, it's very important to keep volunteers busy. They've taken time off work, their time away from family, and they don't want to stand around watching somebody else do the work. They want to be engaged in the science. So we divided up the work. One person was the DBH measure, the crown base height measure. Another person would be designated to take data. Another person would measure out the 10th baker plot and another person would be trained to use a clinometer to find the tree height. So everybody was happy and busy. Some of the results, and like I said, Molly can talk more to this um, in front of her poster. Um, we sent the data to the Missoula Fire Research Center and um, they crunched the numbers and um, they found that there was an 87% decline in density of white bark pine. And I think this is consistent across the crown from what I read from other folks' papers. Um, in comparing the um, agent of mortality, um, in the present day study, the amount of death by blister rust had declined, but the um, mortality by pine beetle and fire had increased. And there is a lot, much larger unknown cause of death than in the um, 90 study. And this is because, I think because it is very hard for um, volunteers to identify cause of death in a 20-year-old snag. Um, so a big decline in death by um, blister rust and big increases in the other two. Overall, a 137% increase in tree mortality. So in conclusion, um, in order to run a very successful citizen science project, it takes a lot of training, um, time, and then practice, and then training and practice. But the uh, public loves to be involved in science projects and it's important for them to understand how management decisions on public lands take place and this is a great way to involve them in that and help them understand the importance of public lands and the importance of keeping the federal wilderness system, preservation system as federal lands um, under the protection and guidance of the Forest Service and other agencies. And last slide, I'd like to thank the um, Forest Health Protection for funding this project through White Bark Pine Restoration Program. Um, I'd like to thank Sydney LaFleren for um, her help the first year of the study. Um, she acted as a technician who helped us uh, learn the protocol and was on the ground with us for some of the study. And I'd like to help um, thank Bob and Molly for helping us along and um, writing up the results and doing the final publication. Thank you.